Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy awesome amy we are live thank you so much for joining me we'd uh welcome. thanks for we'd... inviting me it's nice it's nice to be here even though it's very early where i am where where are you uh i'm in washington dc washington ah, cool thanks for joining me so early i see you you've got your coffee i was saying i've just had lunch i've got mine um so we should have recorded our preamble. We, we, we talked about a bunch of cool things, mostly election stuff. <laughs> it, it's hard to get away from it, especially here in Washington, D.C. Uh, yes. we are, we're living it every moment. Yeah. But you do have a new president, arguably. Uh, yes. Yes, we do. Yeah. By the law and, and the will of the people, we do have a new president, even though there are some who seem to uh, not be able to really. That's true. That's true. So, I mean, this, we, we spoke, I thought it must have been a few weeks ago now, just kind of preamble to the podcast, but you are, so you're the executive director for the sensing, sensing, sensing project. Can I get my words out today? <laughs> um, crazy. And uh, doing lo loads and loads of cool stuff. Um, and I know there's, there's a bunch of things around voting rights that I wanted to dive into with you. Um, but maybe firstly, it would be great to hear a bit about what, what you guys actually do. Yeah, so we are a, a research and advocacy organization that works to end mass incarceration and achieve racial justice in the United States, uh, which, as some folks may know, is, is not a, a small mission in, in the U.S. because we are the world's greatest jailer, uh, you know, 5% wow. of the world's population, yet somehow... So, Almost a quarter of the population. Quarter. Record. Yep. A quarter of the U.S. population is in prison. No, no, no. Uh, uh, we have a quarter of the population, world's population. Oh, prison. yeah, yeah. Uh, Do you? Yes, yes. It's it's it's, it's an astonishing achievement, uh, and one that has taken us forty years to achieve, and <laughs> hopefully will take us less to undo. Uh, but uh, yeah, That's land crazy. of the free is really. And, and what do you and you call so you call them so prisoners felons just to get the terminology right? Well, you know we generally say incarcerated people uh, as part of the uh, anti mass incarceration movement because we want to remind uh, our fellow Americans that we're talking about people's lives here. Uh, these these are our sons and daughters and sisters and brothers who we've chosen to lock up in mass numbers. Wow. And was this, so what was the drive? Is this a kind of a dr drugs related? Ma there, are various, there, there, there are various theories, but, uh, and a lot of facts. I would say the drive actually came in the 1980s and it was a, a reaction uh, both to a demographic bump. So there was an increase in crime in the 1970s, a lot of, you know, social unrest in the United States and across the globe. Uh, but it was also a reaction against the success of the civil rights movement. Uh, right. And so race became um, something that people didn't, couldn't actually talk about. They couldn't be outwardly ra racist, so they talked about crime. Uh, and it was a lot of political stoking of white fear uh, that was incre incredibly successful. So our laws got harsher and harsher. We criminalized lots and lots of activity. Uh, things that in, in other countries you would not end up in prison for, you do in the United States, and that continues. So we brought more and more people into the criminal justice system. We made it harder and harder for them to get out. And we actually lengthened the sentences. So our sentences are much more extreme than the rest of the world, actually, in general. Wow. Interesting. And that's, that was kind of a, a racially driven. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was racially driven. Uh, and it continues to be racially driven. Uh, black people and brown people are disproportionately represented in our prisons and jails across the country in, in every state. Uh, wow. Crazy. Well, yeah. then, so. 
yeah no no that's that's, that's great and even i mean even now i mean there's just so much dialogue around around this um and, and are they because obviously we hear a lot about like the police um mm-hmm. police brutality um you know all of these kinds of things I, I had a story the other day um a friend of mine they live in they live in somewhere near atlanta and her her cousin got accused by a police officer of something he didn't do it he was with the family they ended up you know he ended up i don't know how it happened he ended up having to plead guilty um they said you know it'd be worse for you if you get found guilty plead yeah. guilty or something shorter sentence the poor guy ended up in incarcerated for something that he just didn't do yeah, yeah. Well, there is, because it is, it, it, it's a system of mass incarceration, it's a system of mass warehousing. Uh, but in order to achieve that, you have to incentivize the system to make people feel innocent for the trial. Uh, and so the system is very much set up uh, to force people not to go to trial, to plea. Uh, and, you know, for, frankly, a lot of folks pay a trial penalty. Uh, so if you do go to trial to try to vindicate your rights, uh, and you're found guilty, you will often get a tougher sentence than if you had pled. So all the power, and, and, and part of mass incarceration is that we've shifted power to the prosecutors uh, so that they can charge people and the system is very much weighted towards the state so that the individual defendant really has very little power uh, and there is every incentive, even if you're, if you're innocent, oftentimes to plead guilty. Uh, and, and frankly, you don't get great representation. Uh, and the vast, vast majority of people in our criminal justice system, not only are they black and brown, but they are poor. Uh, so they so can't it afford is, any. It's a class system in a lot of ways, even though we and don't so, like to talk, talk about class in these <laughs> And then, but but then you get you get a, you get someone to defend you, right? If you can't afford it, you do. But the the that quality of defense is very variable, and, and frankly, people have. They're such high caseloads, so they're representing hundreds of people. So the amount of time even the best lawyer could spend on an individual case is very, very small. Uh, right. So it's it's deeply broken in many, many ways. And and at the Sentencing Project, we we are a, attempting to at least fix some of it. Uh, we, you know, we're obviously not alone. There are many people in the United States, both uh, you know uh, policy wants like myself, but also folks on the ground who are, are organizing against mass incarceration. Yeah. Why would you innocent until proven guilty? It yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, it doesn't sound so far. I mean, I, I don't know if you remember the, this is not obviously in the US, but the Austria, Oscar Pretorius case um, with Reva Steenkamp. And if you remember mm-hmm. in, uh, um, he got found guilty yeah. of murder, of murdering her. And anyway, there was a, there's a program on the UK just following that case. And you know the the media circus around it, and 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 they were live broadcasting it. It felt like you know, for Reva who who died, and for Oscar, I just didn't feel like there was like it sought to find justice. And I don't know, you, you sometimes find in in these things, certainly when when they're, when they're high profile, and the media's involved, you know, for the for the victim and and for the accused, I don't know, it doesn't feel like you know it's the right scenario. Yes, well, oftentimes the incentives in, in the system are not justice. There are about a lot of things, but justice is not the primary one. That's true. That's true. I, lo- I know a lot of people in the U.S. incarcerated for, for marijuana and, and related offences. But and, and, and then recently you've got so many states in the U.S. that are making marijuana legal. Are, are we seeing people that have been incarcerated for marijuana related offenses being released now? Yes, I mean, the, the law is changing around that and, right. and the recent election is very encouraging uh, that people will no longer be going to, to prison, hopefully for marijuana charges. So that's a, that's a positive shift. Uh, now it is true that there are still people in the United States who are serving life sentences for drug offenses. Uh, and, you know, there are efforts to undo that, but people are still rotting in jail because of it. Uh, and that is a wrong that needs to be corrected. Uh, and it goes to the fact that we just have overly harsh sentences. Many of the folks who are in jail for life uh, uh, are there because of what we call habitual offender laws. And that that is, why well, you had a first offense, you had a second offense, maybe you had a third offense, and it was three strikes and you're out. 
uh, and then you, you, your your life is gone. It's death by incarceration. And that happens. What's a life a sentence? What's a uh, life sentence then in, it's in America? Life. Well, ma many times in the United States, right. we have folks who are serving life without parole. That means there's absolutely no option. Life with parole, but parole often happens after 40 years. 40 years? years. years yes. Uh, yeah. And then virtual life sentences. People get the sentence of hundreds and hundreds of years because we have so many crimes they can be charged with. And because of overcharging, so you have people serving like 500 year sentences. It's, it sounds irrational because it is. Uh, and as a result, we have more people serving life in prison in this country than, than we're serving in any uh, prison in, in the country in 1970. So 200,000 people are serving life in prison in this country. It's outrageous. It's actually more. We have 80% of the world's prisoners serving life in prison. That's a, an astonishing. So you got to ask yourself, are Americans the worst people in the world? Uh, you know, opinions might differ on that, but uh, you know, it, it it's not that we're we're any worse than any other Homo sapien. It's just that our laws are so irrational and harsh. Yeah, because you obviously the other side of the coin is people that have been affected by crime. You know, family members mm -hmm. who have been murdered, uh, attacked. You know, whatever these pe people are in for. Uh, what, what I mean, I guess they're in. You know, they're in favor of the harsh sentences. I mean, it's a real. It's a real balancing act, isn't it, between... I think you know. it is. Uh, you know, I mean, there is a recent movement uh, amongst the, the victims' rights advocates uh, to take a different approach. Uh, because frankly, we disproportionately uh, incarcerate Black people for violent crime in this country. Uh, and those communities are very impacted. By crime, they're impacted by violent crime. And what we've been hearing from those communities is enough is enough. Uh, we need a different approach. You know, people need to be held accountable. That's definitely true. Yeah. Uh, and, and victims need to feel safe uh, and they need to feel like they, they get justice. But our system often deprives them of both, uh, in addition to robbing communities of people uh, for decades, if not life could return to a society and lead productive lives. Uh, but we don't allow for that to happen in this country. It's, it's as if we're a redemption-free zone. And frankly, those overly harsh laws are oftentimes written by people who are not, who are not victims of crime. They are, they, they are written by prosecutors uh, who, who want an edge or politicians who want to say they're tough on crime without actually looking at the consequences for the community of, of their harsh. Yeah, yeah. So there's not much rehabilitation going on. I mean, no, because it's been nice to see, you know, I mean, if there, if there is, you know, the I mean, for me, the idea, you know, you go save your time, but the, if there's work done around rehabilitation, education, you know, things like that, then it feels like people have a much better chance of being a productive member of society and, and, and less, less chance of them reoffending. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, we know that's true in the United States because we warehouse so many people. Uh, we don't. What do you mean by warehousing? Uh, you know, basically just housing people without any programming or education, uh, and frankly, in very brutal environments. I mean, look at what COVID nineteen is doing to this country. It's absolutely shameful. Uh, but when we look at where the hotspots are. They are in our prisons. The vast majority of the hotspots are in our prisons because they are overcrowded. They are filthy. And you have people living in such close confinement that they can't socially distance. And frankly, a lot of folks in our prisons are very elderly because we have such extreme sentences. And they have pre-existing conditions. The health profile of people in prison is very, very poor because we have no public health care system and the vast majority of folks there never had health insurance. They never really had health care when they were in the free community. And so, so they come in with some serious problems like diabetes and high blood pressure. Uh, and, and, you know, frankly, things that could be controlled, but because we don't invest in, in real medical care, uh, we have people who are really sick and therefore they're vulnerable. So people are dying in our prisons and jails of COVID at a very alarming rates. Wow. So Joe Biden's got a lot to do when he... Uh... <laughs> yeah. But it feels like, I mean, this conversation must be, has been going on 
you know, long before him, right? I mean, oh yes, it's it, it feels like you know, although the you know, like the president for all the power that they have, it's pretty tough for them to get stuff done, right? Like to make real change with things like this, it's it's super yes. hard. And, and our, our criminal justice system, I mean, we've seen the defund the police movement in, in our communities. This is a local issue. Uh, and it goes to because we're a federal system, because we've got 50 states, we've got 50 different governments, we have 50 different corrections and criminal justice systems. So it's actually it's a state by state fight to get right. things changed. Uh, so a, 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 as in everything in the United States, it's a little more complicated uh, and, and it's always interesting. <laughs> so you having so you're having to lobby almost on a state by state basis. That's right. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's it is, it's not a uh, an unambitious no. goal. So on on election stuff, um, it it'll be it's worth discussing voting voting rights. What's the, what, what's the story with that? Well, uh, we have used our criminal justice system to block voting rights uh, forever. I mean, it actually came over from you guys. Uh, yeah. This what we call felony disenfranchisement. It's actually from the English common law, so we can blame you, as we often try to do for our major problem. Uh, so it's a vestige of, of colonialization. Uh, but what happened is that uh, felony disenfranchisement has been used in this country, not only to deny the rights of people who are in prison, but also to deny the rights of people who have left prison, uh, either permanently because they have a criminal record or until they're off probation or, or parole, which in this country can, can be years and even decades. So, 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 wait, so, how, so how does it work? Just to roll back a little. Yeah. Um, so if you're in prison for anything, you can't vote. If you're convicted of a crime, unless you live in the states of Maine or Vermont or now Washington, DC, we changed our law this year, uh, or Puerto Rico, you can't you can't vote in in prison. Right. You have the right to vote if you're in jail because you're not convicted of a crime. But very very few jurisdictions allow that. So if you happen to be in jail on voting day, you have the chance to vote. Fine. And if you're convicted for any any type of of crime, however severe, no voting. No no voting in prison except for those those DC those states. Uh, yeah. So uh, that means. You can't vote, and that's that is. Remember, in the United States, we've got over two million people who are are in prison on any given day, and over seven hundred thousand who are in jail. So this these are substantial populations, and they tend to be poor people, and they tend to be people of color from from the cities, but not always in the cities. Uh, so these are with our razor thin margins. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, we can talk about Georgia that is still contested right now. With the razor thin margins that we're seeing in states, 14,000 votes, the number of people that are disenfranchised, which is 5 million people this year, over 5 million people, that, so, that, can, so, that can determine and that, a lot. And that includes, so, the, so you've got the 2 million or so in prison, and then yeah. people on the, parole can't vote either. Yep, yep, they can't, they can, in, in many states, and, and, and sometimes in some states, people who simply have a criminal record, are, it's a lifetime ban on voting. So it varies by state, but it, it did amount to over 5 million people not being able to vote. So for example, in Florida, uh, which oh, disenfranchised everybody, the, 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 you lost the right to vote if you, you were involved in the, uh, if you had a felony record uh, of any kind. They, the people of Florida actually changed that their constitution to allow people to vote once they left prison. But the, the Republican-dominated legislature, led by the Republican governor, passed a law that said, no, 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 no. You can't vote unless you pay your fines and fees that you owe the courts. But, but the court, no one knew who owed what, including the courts. And so in this last election, over 900,000 people were potentially denied the right to vote in a state that could determine who would be the next president of the United States. So uh, this denial of voting rights, the, allowing the criminal justice system to essentially mediate the fundamental right that we hold as American citizens in a democracy, uh, 
uh, is a disaster, but it's a very deliberate disaster. It actually goes back to the post-Civil War period when felony disenfranchisement laws were passed in the South to deny primarily Black men the vote. Uh, because in the immediate post-Civil War period, uh, Black people voted in huge numbers, at least Black men did, because women didn't have to vote back then. Uh, and they got into office. Uh, and the white people in the South didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that they were losing their lock on political power. So they passed all of the Jim Crow, we call it the Jim Crow laws, yeah. uh, that, uh, you know, the, the taxes to vote, poll taxes, felony disenfranchisement. So it became very popular. And it essentially meant that, that Black people were cut out of political power for over a century, longer, actually, uh, in the South. But that spread to the North, especially in the age of mass incarceration. So we see states like Massachusetts, uh, a very liberal a Northeastern state in this country, yeah. passing felony disenfranchisement laws in the 80s. And that we all know who that was targeted against. It was targeting yeah. against minority communities, and it was extremely successful in denying right. them access to the ballot box. We have in England, uh, I might be corrected here if I'm wrong. I did look it up. I mean, if you're in if you're in prison here, you can't vote. Um, it's interesting because I, I I'm just I was I was trying to gauge for, for like my uh, you know friends and colleagues and where people stand on it because it's such a it's such an interesting conversation. You know, should someone have the right to vote if they've if they've committed a crime? Um, should it depend on the type of crime or how severe the crime is? Um, you know, this obviously the, the history <laughs> that you've just described is uh, is disgusting, right? I mean, you know, the, the reasons that you gave uh, are racist, and you know, um, but then if you take a step back and you say, okay, so if someone's committed a murder, do they give up their right to vote? And I, I think wh where's the the weight of public opinion in the U.S. on that kind of that conversation? It's shifting. The majority believe that people who are on probation and parole should have the right to vote. Uh, and the, the fact is that, that they don't. Uh, so that is, that is an area where we're right to, to change. So you can, yeah, uh, and that's and about three million people. Uh, yes, that's, that, like I said, that, that, that's enough to determine local elections. It's enough to determine the national elections. Uh, now, universal suffrage, which is what, what the Sentencing Project supports, uh, is not yet a mainstream idea. What, what is that uh, exactly? Un universal suffrage. Universal suffrage. We support everyone being the, having the right to vote. We do not think the government should be able to take away our right to vote, and we certainly don't think the criminal justice system should mediate the rights to vote. Now, you get sentenced to prison or or probation or parole by a judge, uh, and that is punishment. The the community can punish you, uh, but our position is that the community should never be able to take the right to vote away. And, and, and partially that's a historical, uh, it's, a, it's a retrospective look at how uh, the right to vote has been used to disenfranchise certain communities. We don't want to give the government that option. It's too dangerous. We've seen how it can be used to disenfranchise the black community for centuries. Uh, and certainly the criminal justice system, which is the course of power of the state, should yeah. not be able to ever mediate the voting rights. Uh, because, quite frankly, uh, you know, uh, denying the right to vote for people in prison is perhaps politically popular, or at least it's not politically unpopular at this point in time. Yeah. But if you allow that, who, who's next? Who's next? What other unpopular group? Until finally, it's you. Uh, so that is a risk that we don't want to take. And I think Americans have sat on our democracy too long. This uh, uh, recent election uh, and the last four years have, have certainly proven that. Uh, that we didn't protect our voting rights. We, 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 we largely ignored what was happening. Many of us didn't even ever vote. We didn't bother to vote. We had uh, very low turnover, turnout. Yeah. 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 yeah, we had record turnout now. These people finally woke up and thought, oh my gosh, my fate is actually in my hands. The only power I have is the vote. And frankly, numbers are the power that we have. Uh, we've got giant multinational corporations. We've got giant government uh, all of that can be aligned against the people. All we have are our numbers, uh, and so every every vote is precious. Yeah. So what can what can be done? Because it sounds like it's going to be pretty tough to change 
the the ability of current inmates to vote it sounds like you're you're having some success on the on the people on parole is that what you've been focusing on well we focus on the long game okay uh, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> yes we start there uh, yeah. but like in my own hometown here in washington dc we passed a law this year that allows everyone to vote regardless of, of whether or not great work people. great work on you guys to, <laughs> yeah. to get that sorted uh, a lot a lot a lot of work went into that and you know that was very much led uh, by the black community here which and so did you say just to be clear if, if you're an inmate you can vote yes yes indeed amazing yes. Uh, any any with any any conviction any length of time absolutely yes it's universal right. suffrage. And frankly, in the states of Maine and Vermont, it has always been the case. Right. Uh, they have never denied any prisoner the right to vote. Okay. And uh, Puerto Rico changed its laws in the 1980s. So it's, it is, right. there is precedent. Yeah. And, and is this a postal vote? They cast their vote, post it? Yes. Although in some places, they actually bring in polling, a polling place. Oh, in the public. And just out, and out of interest, you might not have these stats, but... What percentage of the prison population in DC actually ended up voting? We don't yet know. Love to we know don't that. Yet know. Uh, and that's that is a complicated reason because we don't have our actual because DC is not a state. Uh, we don't have a prison system. Our our folks go into the federal prison system, the Bureau of Prisons, which is okay. headed, of course, by by uh, President Trump. Uh, and they were not too excited to allow our, our prisoners to vote. So we <laughs> had to work very, very hard uh, right. to uh, not only get people registered, but also to get them ballots. Yeah. Uh, so it's unclear how many. They wouldn't even give us the names of people. Uh, uh, in, uh, so in Maine, would you be able to find out in Maine? Um, you know, I bet they do track that. I don't know what it is. Because they've got two electoral colleges there, right? Yes, yes. And and I mean, these are these are relatively small states, yeah, uh, yeah. the northeastern states, and it's just been part of their culture. Uh, they never adopted that colonial uh, <laughs> a law for felon disenfranchisement from you guys. Uh, Sorry. Live for it. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's it is. One of our positions is that because the black community has been so broadly disenfranchisement and disenfranchised um, by uh, criminal justice involvement in this country, it's very clear that they've been denied the vote and they also have been denied the ability to change these policies because they have all they're, they're politically motivated. If you don't have any political power, uh, you can't be, you know mandate that the police engage in, in rational anti-racist behavior. You, you can't impact what the sentences look like or who gets prosecuted or who gets elected as a prosecutor. Uh, so the fact that the criminal justice system has mediated voting rights, especially for the black community, has meant that they have had no say in what the criminal justice system looks like for generations. Uh, and as a result, we now, as I've said, we've got the biggest uh, prison population in the world. Uh, it is out of control. So there's been no real democratic stop against the, these uh, horrible policies that have impacted especially poor people of color. Yeah, it's crazy. It's great work you're doing, I think. I mean, it's, it's nice that there's a precedent, you know, a few states that have that have done it. I think it's, um, yeah, it's really, it's just such an interesting conversation. And for, for many of the reasons you discussed, um, Good luck with it. I think it's, uh, it's a really good. You know, it's a great thing to do, and uh, you know, and you're doing it for the right reasons, um, which I think is great. And I think you're also, you are you also you're also campaigning for to, to end life imprisonment as well. That's right. We, we're, yeah. Our system is way too extreme. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got over two hundred thousand people in this country who are serving life in prison. They're going to die in prison. Uh, not because they, they have a capital sentence, uh, although some of our states, as you know, still have the death penalty. Uh, but that is a relatively few number of people compared to those we sentence to death by incarceration. How, what percentage is, is a men versus women? I know you've been doing quite a bit of work on, on, on female, on women in car. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So uh, because women are, they're about 10% 
of our prison population, uh, okay. and, and they are slightly less of the life incarcerated. Uh, but women is the, are the fastest growing population in not only across the board in prison, uh, but they are also the, the growing faster in the life imprisoned numbers. Why? We, that is a very good question. Um, <laughs> it's, we're, it's shocking, actually, because the vast majority of women are not in prison for violent offenses. Uh, they're there for property crimes or drug crimes, uh, even much more more than male prisoners. So, why women are especially getting life without parole? Sentences. You can't get life for that, can you? Can you get, yeah. can you get life for, for drug sentences? Oh it, yes, you still can. You still right. can in some jurisdictions uh, because of habitual offender laws. Mm. Uh, so we're seeing more women getting sentenced to life than ever before. Uh, and frankly, our sentences are, you know, our crime rates have gone down, despite what you might see in the media because of uh, political posturing, uh, especially in the lead up to the election. In general, violent crime in the United States is down, down, down right. uh, at historical lows. And, and that has been the case uh, for over a decade. It's been declining. And uh, so our question is, if violent crime is going down in the United States, why is life sentencing going up and in particular life without the possibility of parole which is the harshest possible sentence is growing more what if it doesn't drug make offenses? any sense no and the drug offenses also i mean it's not worked you know this war on, on on drugs and stuff you look at portugal um so portugal had the worst drugs um history uh record in europe for like loads of, of addicts people really 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 tough and they decriminalized all drugs. And so rather than putting uh, someone in prison for possessing heroin or something, they'd give them a clean needle. Um, they'd give them the ability to go to a clinic and clean themselves up. And they've gone from the worst record in Europe to the best. So rather than putting them in prison, give them help, you know, like it's an addiction. Yeah. Right, right. Treat it like a public health problem, which is what yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I've, I, I would like to see that all over the United States. You know, the state of Oregon actually just passed laws in this last election. They're very, they're based on the Portuguese model, right? Uh, because they too, you know, they have a serious drug problem, especially with opioids and heroin. Uh, and we know we've been we've been locking up uh, people who are addicted to drugs for the last 40 years in record numbers, and we still have a horrible drug problem in this country. It's clear it doesn't work to put people in prison. Uh, right. And, you know, frankly, as, as a lawyer for years, uh, going into prisons and talking to my clients, I know they got the best drugs of their life in prison. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I know. It, um, it, I mean, and there was no drug treatment available in prison. Uh, right. And we, now we have problems with, with a lot of people ODing and dying in prison uh, because of drugs. Uh, you know, we're treating it exactly the wrong way. And of course, when, when folks return home from prison, you've got a criminal record in this country and many countries getting a job, getting housing, uh, getting back into the community and, and just earning a livelihood is virtually impossible. Uh, so we put all these barriers in place and then we expect people to, to change. Uh, it's just not going to happen. It's irrational. No. I mean, if you're coming out of if you're coming out of prison and you've been and you're on drugs, I mean, you're going to have to try and get drugs, which is, again, probably illegal. So you could reoffend. Uh, and then, you know, and in this country, you get you get put in a flat. You don't get given a job. You end up, you know, you find people in a flat all on their own, no job, nothing to do, not contributing to society, not really sure what to do. And, and then they end up reusing, reoffending, reentering prison. So it's, you and know. And can we be surprised? I mean, of course that's what's going to yeah but there's some great there's some great organizations here and i'm sure also in the u.s that, that do really great work to help people as they come out you know help yes, them try and find the job and... that, that is that is true it's just it's never it's not enough because it's not there aren't enough resources for everybody and it should be it shouldn't be luck that you happen to, to get hooked up with the right organizations that can actually help you yeah. Uh, we, in, in this country, in the United States, we spend billions and billions of dollars blocking people in prison and jail, and we spend very, very little money actually helping them return to the community. It's also, do you know, I, I'd love to see, 
it's so easy to donate money to charity right you know here's here's my direct debit details i'll tap and i'll tap your thing you know it's also easy to take to pluck up the courage to say hey do you know what i'm going to give you a job come and work in my company you know yeah, yeah. that's harder that's just you know you're hard. saying you're saying okay you've got a criminal record you've done whatever but i'm going to give you another chance and i'm going to give you a job and i'm going to train you except that's that's more impactful but that's that's when you really find out about yourself so i was thinking the other you know okay i'm happy to give money but sh can i give someone a job you know and that's when you yeah. find out what you really your, your feelings really are yeah yeah no i mean that's uh, when you when you when you directly put yourself in, in into the role of uh helping change that, yeah. that is and it's it is certainly necessary because folks do, the barriers to employment are very yeah, uh, and it's incredibly easy to find out if somebody has a criminal record. But also, that's the way. That's the way, right? You want to feel as a human that you are contributing to society and you're being useful and you're directing your energies in a positive way. You yes. know, if you if you don't have that in your life, it's so easy to stray. You know, it's a very fine line that you can cross over. Oh yeah, I mean, it's 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 asking the impossible. Yeah, yeah. We do a lot to set folks up to fail and then act surprised. Yeah. Well, great place to end, Amy. Um, let's work towards that. Let's work towards that. It's a good thing yes, to work Yeah, absolutely. Towards. Good talking with you, Lewis. Like Thank that. you again. Yeah, thanks for joining me and keep up all the great work. Um, and I look forward to hearing how it all goes. Yes, yes. I will, uh, I will uh, give you a call when we have our election party and, and there's universal suffrage in the United States. True democracy is what we're looking for. Definitely. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Take care. See ya. Bye.